In terms of the agenda here, what we want to look at is what is the OS Containers Extensions, or ZCX for short. What use cases does this enable? A bit in terms of how does one get started with ZCX and, and how does one manage and monitor ZCX. We also did try to uh, bring in a little bit more of a, a small uh, mini dive, I would say, into the networking considerations for ZCX as well. Uh, so with that, starting to just take a step back and just take a look at the motivation for this function. What you'll see here uh, on this chart is basically ZOS, as ZOS has uh, been around right for a very long time, uh, supporting a lot of the workloads, middleware, subsystems, and languages that you're used to today, uh, right, like Kix and IMS and, uh, and batch workloads and DB2 and so forth. And basically, kind of look at the history of, of ZOS, I don't know, probably about 25 years ago. It's been, it, it's hard to imagine it's been that long. We introduced this function called Unix System Services. Granted, at the time, that for those that remember, we called it OMVS, right? But uh, this brought a Unix personality to the ZOS platform. What that, uh, that was a, a pretty fundamental change in that it started enabling additional languages, right? Like C, C++, but it also allowed uh, IBM vendors and, and users to be able to port software that was developed for Unix platforms and basically be able to port them, recompile them, and so forth, and deploy them within ZOS. And that gave rise to things like we said, C, C++ applications, but it enabled IBM to bring Java to the platform, which enabled us to bring WebSphere and all the WebSphere uh, types of products on top of that, things like ZOSMF. It allowed us really to launch initiatives like Zoe and Spark, right, by being able to port software onto ZOS. So, so that was a pretty fundamental change to what, they, what types of software you could run on ZOS. And, and with ZCX, we're taking this next significant step that basically says, you know, we're expanding the, the ZOS ecosystem to, to allow you to basically be able to take Linux software, software that was developed for Linux, specifically on Z, for the Z architecture, packaged as Docker containers, and be able to deploy those in binary format, so without modifying, recompiling the software, directly inside of ZOS. Right? So we, we think this is that uh, uh, you know, significantly expands the types of software right, that you can exploit from a ZOS perspective. Right? So try to contrast it a little bit to Unix system services. Right? That opened up quite a few avenues. Uh, we think ZCX will have a similar type of effect. Now, uh, more specifically, what is IBM ZOS Containers Extensions, or ZCX? You'll hear me use that uh, abbreviation throughout the presentation. It is a new function in the next uh, release of the operating system, ZOS 2.4, that becomes available at the end of this month, that enables you to be able to deploy Linux on Z software as Docker containers inside of a ZOS system in direct support of ZOS workload. So what we're really looking at is not just being able to host Linux software just because, right, but be able to bring Linux software that can help complement and expand what you do with your ZOS systems, right, that typically would have some affinity to other ZOS software that's running natively uh, inside the platform. And be able to do that without requiring you to have a separately provisioned Linux server, right, because you could do this today, right, you could deploy complementary software on a Linux server, on Z, on distributed, and so forth. Here you basically can do this inside of ZOS. And the key thing that we're really looking at here is to basically allow you to build hybrid solutions consisting of native ZOS software and Linux software and be able to manage it from a ZOS perspective, right? Using your operational controls that you have today and with ZOS qualities of service. So we'll do a deeper dive into what that means as we go along through the presentation. Uh, in order to activate this function, you do require an IBM Z14 processor. Uh, and it does require a unique feature code, feature code uh, 0104, that you also need to basically uh, have enabled on that, on that Z14 processor. Now, uh, just a key clarification, the Z14 prereq is for this specific function of 2.4, not for ZOS 2.4 in general, right? ZOS 2.4 will run on Z13s and earlier machines as well, but in order to exploit container extensions, you need to be have a Z14 processor with this feature code. 
If I was to describe what the function provides using a design thinking hill statement, so basically a single sentence that tries to describe the capability, it goes something along what you see at the bottom there. I'll read it out. Uh, solution architect can create a solution to be deployed on ZOS based on components available as Docker containers in the Linux on Z ecosystem, transparently exploiting ZOS qualities of service and without requiring ZOS development skills. It's quite a sentence, and, and we'll try to dissect that as we go through, uh, uh, through the presentation. And when we say solution architect, this would be somebody who's responsible for designing a line of business solution, perhaps in your environments, that may span ZOS and distributed uh, platforms. But it could be a you know, software engineer, right, application developer. Uh, it could even be a system programmer, right, depending on what it is that you're deploying here. Uh, but the key notion here is, again, being able to bring Linux on Z software, be able to deploy it on ZOS, manage it from a ZOS perspective. We want the developer that's looking at this environment, right, to be able to deploy software just like they would on Linux on Z or any other platform using a standard Docker container technology. So uh, what is Docker? So we will hit on this just a little bit, just to make sure that everybody has at least a high level understanding of Docker. But you, you have probably heard about Docker, you have probably heard of containers, right? Uh, orchestration, all of that is uh, you know, quite popular in the industry these days. Uh, when folks talk about a cloud native uh, development experience, they're usually talking about containers. And, and Docker is a uh, open source standard that you could view it as a standard for packaging software, right? It's basically uh, gives the capability for application developers typically in the Linux world, but it is supported on other platforms as well, be able to uh, build a, uh, a package, a software package, right, of their application, but along with every dependency that that application has. So if, they're, if the application developer is building a web, uh, an application that runs on a web server, be able to include the web server in that package, be able to include the level of Linux that they're you know, uh, testing with, that they're creating that, that the application with, be able to include any other complementary yeah. software that's in, installed on that host that this application depends on, and um, produce what's called a Docker image. That basically is a composite, you know, a binary image that points to that ex same exact level of software and its configuration, right? And it's basically freeze-dried into this Docker image. What this allows is anybody who has a Docker server environment to be able to take that image and deploy it and get an exact replica of that software at those levels, right, configured in the same exact manner as the developer, you know, created this for, right? So, so this allows you to basically have this standard, right, of packaging the software and deploying it across development, QA, test, production, right, all operating against the same image and knowing that they have the same exact image of software versus an application developer makes their application available, right, and you need to go install it on top of a web server of some sort. It may have database dependencies. You need to go figure out what database setup is required, right? And if you're not running at the same exact levels as what the developer was, right, things may or may not work as, as planned, right? So, um, so this, this agile development this ability to be able to package software and easily distribute it and deal with dependencies is what's making Docker and containers very popular in the industry. So when we started looking about this capability of bringing Linux on Z software, be able to deploy it in ZOS, this was a good model for us in you know, simplifying, reducing the complexity of what we needed to basically open up and provide to end users. We could just focus as Docker as being the packaging and deployment mechanism for the software inside of ZOS. The other thing that's very popular here is that there are a lot of containers that have been uh, created. So if you go out on Docker Hub and you'll see this link here, you, you should be able to link to. Uh, Docker Hub is an external registry for Docker images and it contains lots of open source and ISV and IBM and other software all packaged as Docker images. When you're looking at that, what you really want to look at is the software that's available for Linux on Z and um, S390X is the designation of the architecture, or you might see IBM Z also as a selection thing that you can do. So basically, the software we're talking about being able to support is 
any Docker images packaged for S390X, right? Be able to take those and deploy them within, within this environment. Okay, in terms of, you know, peeling the onion a little bit more, what is it that we're really providing? So what, what we provide with ZOS Containers Extension is you can view it as a virtual Docker appliance. It's basically an appliance that gets deployed in a ZOS address space. The appliance consists of a Linux kernel and a uh, open source uh, standard Linux Docker engine that uh, basically gets deployed within a ZOS address space. And, and, and the way that you deploy uh, this function is through ZOSMF uh, workflows. So view it as uh, ZOSMF workflows are a way to automate, right? Certain types of JCL or Rex execs or things of that nature, right? View it here is with ZOSMF, IBM provides you with a workflows that will allow you to provision a virtual Docker server for ZCX. But uh, the actual underlying Linux kernel, Docker, all of that is prepackaged software that we provide that you get with your ZOS 2.4 uh, basically operating system. So you don't need to go out there and you know obtain a Linux uh, kernel or Docker or any of those things. Once you provision it and you start it up, you have a Docker server, you can get started by basically pulling images from Docker Hub or somewhere else and deploying them. And the way that you would deploy them within this environment is using standard Docker command line interfaces. So this experience would look identical, right, to Docker running on a Linux platform, be it on Z or on, on a different platform itself, x86 and so forth. So no ZOS skills specifically, right, to go deploy this because it's uh, the skills you, you'll require is, is Docker. Now, the software that runs in here, right, you can run one or more containers, right? Each container may be a software package that consists of, uh, you know, one or two processes, or it could consist of 10 Linux processes, right? But the point here is that you can view this as a Linux host that supports multiple containers, right, that basically uh, provide different functionality. You can also start multiple ZCX instances within a ZOS system. And we'll talk about some of the use cases of why that would be interesting. Now, the other key thing here is how does the software you deploy within the uh, container extensions address space communicate with native ZOS software? So we talked about complementing your Kix and your IMS and your WebSphere workloads running on ZOS. They communicate over standard IP communications, so sockets, if you will. The, the, the key co caveat there is that we provide for a high-speed cross-memory virtual network that basically allows us right, to do this very efficiently. So standard TCP communications, but view it as with very good performance because after all, right, we're really address spaces running within the same ZOS system, right? So there's no need for an external network. And, and we'll do a deeper dive on the networking uh, as, we, as we go through this. Now, finally, from a Linux perspective, this is when we say this is an appliance, uh, we say that because you really need to focus on the Docker functionality, the Docker interfaces is really what we're providing you with. You don't have access to get root access to the underlying Linux kernel. And that's by design because we, we not only provide you the Linux, but we also maintain it, configure it on your behalf. Right, so uh, there's no, uh, there's very limited, right, Linux skills that are required to basically uh, manage the underlying Linux kernel, if you will. Okay, so one uh, uh, final thing here that I just want to point out is that all the workloads running within ZCX, so the Linux kernel, the Docker engine, and the containers themselves, right, are all zip, zip eligible. So if you have zip processors on your ZOS system, right, these address spaces, you know, run primarily on those zip processors, right, if, if that capacity is available. Key theme here, again, is let's find use cases where you can complement what you're doing with your ZOS native software, right, by bringing in Linux software in binary format. They do need to be in Docker images and deploy them side by side with your ZOS, you know, native software and manage them the, the whole infrastructure from a ZOS perspective. Now, um, in terms of some of the qualities of service that we're talking about, we, we talked about being able to take some of the ZOS qualities of service and extend them transparently to the Linux software, right? Without that software really being aware of this. 
So these are some of the categories, and I'm going to start with storage resilience as, as the first one, even though that's second here. Um, but, you know, when we look at you're deploying a Linux host, uh, you're deploying Docker, you're deploying applications, they're going to need to save their data somewhere, right, on disk, on Linux disks. How that's implemented underneath the covers is by leveraging ZOS vSAM data sets. So all the Linux guests, all the Linux disks without Linux really knowing this, are backed with ZOS vSAM data sets. So if you want to do things like pervasive encryption, right, you can do that for these data sets just like you would any other ones. And now suddenly you have transparent pervasive encryption for all your Linux software that you're deploying within this environment. But other things from a resilience perspective like hyperswap, right? These are normal ZOS data sets. So hyperswap could be used for full tolerance, right? What this also allows us to do is normal storage replication, disk replication for ZOS can be extended to these disks, which allows you to basically integrate the disaster recovery planning, right? For this Linux software with your GDPS processes that you may have today, right? So if you're doing storage replication for your GOS data sets for an alternate data center, you include these as well. You can recover these workloads, right, in tandem with uh, how you recover your, 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 your native GOS workload because, after all, they're running within your GOS operating system environment as well. Uh, networking, uh, we will do a deeper dive on this, but we will talk about dynamic VIPAs, being able to extend those for container extensions, and, and we'll see uh, uh, what we mean by that when we get to, to that uh, discussion. And we also talked about a high-speed, secure, you know, pipe that will allow us to communicate very efficiently from Linux to native ZOS applications. And then finally, you already saw that this is an address space, right, or one or more address spaces. So it can be managed from a ZOS perspective, right? There can be a WLM classification that assigns that address space to a service class with service class goals with business level importances with the ability to cap uh, resource usage. There's SMF records, right? They get created because this is, again, an address space. So if you're looking at your Type 30 records, right, you'll get those created that will capture CPU consumption and so forth for this workload as well. Now, uh, if we take a look at some of the high level use cases. Uh, so here, uh, we'll start with categories of use cases. And really, the, the most important one that we started with is this whole notion about expanding the ZOS software ecosystem. So what that basically means is, is bringing functions that maybe are available on Linux on Z in the open source that are not available on ZOS to ZOS. So that could be leveraging the latest microservices, right, that you want to be able to extend ZOS applications to leverage microservices from open source that are deployed, for instance, in ZCX. What this, what this address, uh, attempts to address is the fact that if you can extend ZOS software to act as a client to services deployed in Linux, think about how you manage those dependencies, right? From an availability perspective, from a DR perspective, from a service level management perspective. By being able to bring those inside of ZOS and manage them with your ZOS controls, it simplifies that dependency management significantly. Let's say you have software in ZOS that wants to use a NoSQL database like MongoDB, for instance. Um, analytics, we're doing a lot to bring analytics, AI, machine learning natively to ZOS. But there is a lot of frameworks, a lot of complementary software that's not available natively on ZOS. Wouldn't it be nice if you could deploy those right within ZCX right on the same ZOS system? Uh, some other use cases revolve around open source, like Apache Kafka is a messaging framework. And we've had clients that uh, want to be able to expose ZOS data transactions or events to an Apache Kafka messaging infrastructure. Right, that's becoming very popular for application developers. Um, web server proxy, something like an Nginx server, and so forth, and any number of other emerging, you know, programming languages and, and environments. The next tier of uh, use cases is around system management. So the idea here is there are cases where there's software that you may need to deploy on a Linux platform that you cannot deploy inside of ZOS today but you need to deploy that on a Linux platform in order to manage your ZOS system. So one example of that, for, for instance, is from an IBM perspective is the 
uh, Service Management Unite software, or SMU. So if you're using things like IBM System Automation, Omegamon, NetView, you might be familiar with SMU. It provides a browser-based UI, right, into IBM System Automation, Omegamon, and, and these other products. But it runs on Linux. So we've had clients that said, you know, I really want to be able to deploy that with ZOS because it really is part of my ZOS infrastructure. That way, again, if I have a disaster recovery event or something like that, it can move along with my ZOS workloads. And then finally, the last tier is around the, the space of open source application development. We're doing a lot there, right, with ZOSMF, with Zoe, trying to modernize the application developer experience. But, and that's great progress. But what about being able to grab some of the latest tooling that might be available in open source on Linux and be able to deploy them inside of ZCX to enhance the ZOS application developer's experience? And that's what that category is about. How does the technology actually work? So we're going to take a deeper dive now into how does this, how does this, how does this really work, right? How do we bring Linux and, and, and run it inside of a ZOS address space? So if we take a look at this, right, we have, this is the picture we started with. Uh, we have a Linux kernel. The first thing that, that we, we require is a virtualization layer that allows us to basically boot up a Linux guest, right, inside of ZOS. And the technology we use there is very similar, right, for this virtualization layer to what we use on System Z for ZVM, for KVM on Z, right, to host second level guests. So the Z architecture is very functionally rich, right, in, in providing this virtualization capability. So the same technology is used to boot up Linux, but Linux will need to go access things like, for instance, disk, right, and, and network. So if we look at, at, at uh, disk access, uh, what we leverage is that inside of Linux, um, they have this notion of virt, uh, virtual I.O. drivers, virt I.O. drivers. So these are standard device drivers that Linux provides that are really for being able to make it easier to bring up a, um, uh, a, a Linux as a, in a virtualized type of environment. So there's a vert IO driver for storage, right? And when we talk about storage here, we're talking about disk, not memory, right? That allows us to seamlessly intercept all the IO calls, right, that the Linux kernel would make to disks. And what we do underneath the covers is we basically intercept those calls and map them into ZOS vSAM uh, calls. So what we have is basically the ability to represent every disk that the Linux kernel will need, right, as a set of vSAM files, right? So these are normal uh, ZOS vSAM data sets. They are linear data sets in, in case you're, you're interested in the specific uh, characteristics. But again, Linux itself doesn't know that it's vSAM underneath the covers. All they need is some, some persistent storage, right? So, for instance, we talked about pervasive encryption, right? The capability we have today to do that for ZOS vSAM datasets extends, right? The ZOS vSAM datasets, so it extends to this function as well. So if you enable host-based encryption here, you can protect the data, right, of all the software that's deployed within ZCX without Linux or the applications knowing that. We talked about resiliency, right? So things like hyperswap. So if you had a failure in the primary data sets here, right, you can use hyperswap to transparently, right, in real time switch to the alternates. The same notion is extended also for networking. So there's a vert IO driver for networking that we basically implemented that allows us to basically intercept, right, um, inbound and outbound calls from the Linux kernel, right, to send and receive packets. And the first thing that we've done here is basically extend our dynamic VIPA support to allow uh, for our application instance dynamic VIPAs to also be used to represent a ZCX virtual Docker server instance. Basically, it represents the IP address of that Linux kernel. And that's interesting in that it has the same capabilities as other DVIPAs, meaning that if you, it allows us to stop this ZCX instance on one ZOS LPAR and start it on another LPAR within the same sysplex and have that dynamic wipe up address, right, move dynamically just like they do today for any other workload. The other piece that we talked about is this high-speed communication blink, right, that allows us to very efficiently communicate between 
containers running in ZCX, and address spaces that are co-located within the same address space. So we'll take a look at that in more detail. Now, how do we get traffic in and out of ZCX? So there, it's basically, you can view it as the ZCX container extensions has a high-speed connection to the ZOS TCP IP stack. But basically, in order for it to reach the outside network, it's going to come in through ZOS TCP IP. Just like normal traffic is today, it'll come in over OSA, hypersockets, and then get routed, if you will, into uh, one or more ZCX instances. And we have a picture that will show this in a little bit more detail. That does allow you to basically also be able to take ZOS IP filters, right? And if you have IP security policies, extend them to basically govern this traffic pattern as well. Now, um, looking at this from a CPU memory and workload management perspective, so as uh, we mentioned, each address space represents a virtual Linux guest, if you will. That Linux operating system instance will require some memory. Right? So Linux needs to have a, a set of real frames, real memory, that it can basically implement its virtualized memory on top of that. So that is a memory that we allocate above the 2 gigabyte bar. It's private memory within that address space. Above the 2 gigabyte bar, it is fixed memory. So uh, it does need to be dedicated right, uh, to that ZCX address space. And it's managed, obviously, through, through the ZOS operating system. In terms of uh, virtual CPU, so Linux will also need to know how many processors it has. So there's this notion that when you provision ZCX, you indicate how many virtual CPUs you would like. And underneath the covers, basically these processors are implemented as MBS dispatchable units, as MBS tasks. That basically, if you provision a ZCX with four virtual processors, you would have four MBS TCBs running within that address space that the ZOS operating system could dispatch concurrently, potentially, right, based on dispatch priorities that's derived based on your workload manager, service class goals, and priorities, just like any other address space, right? So those virtual processors are not dedicated processors, right? They're typically you're going to be dispatched on zip processors if you have them available, right, just like any other process address space would you're sharing those CPU resources, right, with other uh, uh, applications. So in the picture here, you'll see a WLM policy. If you could define a service class, uh, you would classify this address space as a starter task. You could give it a business importance level, an execution velocity goal. You can optionally specify tenant resource groups that you could cap, you know, CPU consumption. So like in this example, we have a CPU cap of two CPUs, so it would basically say, I don't want this ZCX instance, right, to ever exceed two full CPUs worth of processing. And then again, this is an address space. Normal SMF data uh, applies in terms of type 30 records, WLM type 72 records. All of that basically uh, applies for this as well, because after all, it is an address space. Now, can you run multiples of these? And the answer is yes. You can deploy multiple instances of ZCX within a single LPAR. Some of the reasons why you might want to do that is you may want to be able to isolate containers, the types of software that you're deploying between one instance or another. You may want to be able to give higher WLM priority to a certain set of containers than others. So the only way to do that is really to run them in different address spaces that have different service class management goals. Right? You may also want to be able to isolate resources, how much memory you make available for some versus other containers. You could do that by placing them again in different ZCX instances. Now, the key thing here is that each ZCX address space has some dedicated resources for things like memory, disk storage, if you will, and network in terms of IP addresses. You'll see here that each one of them will have a unique virtual IP address. Unique memory that's assigned to it. May, one may have two gigabytes, the other one may have four gigabytes. Different amount of disk space depending on the types of workloads you're running in there. The things that are common is the virtual processors, right? So we're not dedicating CPU engines, right? These are sharing within the C C CPUs, right, that you have on the system with other workloads as well. So uh, from a high level perspective, again, WLM is instrumental here, right, in terms of governing access to the, the processors, right, prioritizing one ZCX instance versus another versus all the other workload that you may have running on your system. 
Okay, so if we take a look a little bit uh, about integrating from an operational perspective, so if we look at uh, a ZOS system, this is a address space. How do you start it? You start it using a start command, right? And you stop it with stop, and there is a modify command that gives you the capability to display certain attributes of ZCX. So that means, you know, in terms of automation, you could use whatever system automation you're using today. It could be IBM system automation, another system automation product, or if you use ARM, the built-in ZOS uh, automatic restart manager, right? We're also providing support where we're registering with ARM, so it allows you to define an ARM policy to automatically start this stuff. If uh, there's a, a, a planned or an unplanned outage, right, uh, of a ZCX instance, you just need to restart it in place using any of those options, right, just like you would for any other ZOS started task. So this is the part about being able to, you know, deploy your Linux software, but tie it into your system autom uh, automation uh, type of processing within ZOS. Now, taking a look at a slightly more interesting uh, failure scenario, we're in a Sysplex environment and we have ZCX running on system A. Let's say we lost that LPAR, right, uh, or ZCX task, and you're able to basically use whatever automation, you know, procedures you have today to restart that ZCX instance on another LPAR within the Sysplex. The only key thing you need here is you need to have access to the same vSAM data sets, right? Uh, same vSAM volumes across the Sysplex. And by using dynamic VIPAs, right? As long as you have that VIPA defined on that backup system, right? We, you know, you guys are familiar with dynamic VIPAs, right? And, and, and their movement characteristics. That IP address would move. OMP route would advertise it's uh, that movement right to the network and clients can basically reconnect. Now, uh, taking that to the next level where let's say we're looking at site level or data, set, uh, data center level recovery. In this case, we have a stretch sysplex, single sysplex across two data centers. And let's say we lost the entire site, site A. And in this case, we're gonna restart system A on the backup data center, right? It's basically, the same type of processes you would use today to restart system A, right, would bring along this workload as well, right? So this again speaks again to the integrated, you know, business continuity, disaster recovery types of operations. Okay, let's take a deeper look at the networking for ZCX. So uh, we're gonna get started with a high level view uh, ZCX and networking and introduce this this notion of this high-speed virtual IP network. This is basically based on same host uh, technology. You may or may not, that this acronym may, may not resonate. You're probably using it today. Uh, same host is, a, you can view it as a virtual point to point, to point or point to multi-point um, uh, link uh, device driver, if you will, within ZOS today, that you use if you're using Enterprise Extender, right? That that's coming across a same host link. This is what allows us to get packets in and out of, you know, VTAM, right? From VTAM into in, in, into and out of the TCP/IP stack. If you're using multiple TCP/IP stacks, right? Today, you may have same host links across those, right? But basically, uh, we did uh, take that underlying same host technology and expand it and made it unique to ZCX. But in this picture here, we have uh, a single ZOS LPAR, a single TCP IP stack, right, that has uh, external connectivity, perhaps through uh, HyperSockets or OSA, and we have two ZCX instances. Each ZCX instance, right, is its own address space and is running its own unique containers, right? So if we look at the network communication patterns, right, basically when you start these up, each ZCX instance will have its own unique dynamic VIPA. This is an application instance dynamic VIPA that represents that instance, right? ZOS itself will have one or more IP address, right? That's the 10.1.1. address, right? Let's call that a static VIPA that represents external access into that LPAR, right? Uh, when we initialize this environment, each ZCX instance will have a specific same host link into the ZOS TCP IP stack. So this is the part where we said same host is a point to multi-point link. From a ZOS perspective, right, we have a, 
a same host device that connects to one or more ZCX instances, so that's the multipoint. From a ZCX perspective, they're always connecting to exactly, it's a point-to-point -point link, right? They're, they're connecting into the ZOS TCP IP stack. So if we look at uh, network traffic patterns, right? You may have a pattern where a container in a ZCX instance one wants to communicate to ZCX instance two. So that traffic basically leaves Linux, right? ZCX one gets routed over our same host link to the ZOS TCP IP stack that then takes those packets and says, ah, okay, they're destined for the DVIP associated with ZCX2. It will basically forward that traffic, right, to the ZCX2 instance. So in that scenario, again, we don't have to ever go external to the ZOS system to do that, but it is a internal IP forwarding path, if you will. Now, uh, the other flow is you have a native ZOS application that wants to consume services that are running as Linux containers. So we said there that's TCP IP sockets typically, right? Maybe a REST API and maybe some other type of API. And that communication pattern from ZCX1, right? That Linux kernel is going to route that traffic to the ZOS TCP IP stack over the same host link. And Basically, TCP IP then gets control and knows that that, app, that traffic is destined to the local application and continues right down that path and delivers right that data to the normal, uh, to the ZOS native application. And vice versa, right? If you're sending data from ZOS into ZCX, that traffic flows down the TCP IP stack. TCP IP says, ah, okay, this is not really going externally. It's going to ZCX. It will forward it over that same host link. And then finally, the last data pattern is external traffic. So external traffic coming uh, in and out of the system from ZCX or targeting ZCX, it will first get routed using normal topology to the ZOS TCP IP stack. That's, that's basically advertising routes for those DVIPAs. And then it will get routed right over the appropriate same host link to the appropriate ZCX instance. Uh, this routing that I mentioned, right, packets coming in and getting routed, do not require you to enable your ZOS system with datagram forwarding. So we recognize that this is a special use of forwarding, just like we do for Syspix Distributor. So you do not require IP config datagram forwarding to be enabled in order for us to do this, this type of routing. Right. Now, uh, configuration steps. So when you deploy a ZCX instance, you will, need, uh, uh, you will need to provide whoever is responsible for running those ZOSMF workflows with some networking information. They'll need a ZCX IP address. That needs to be a dynamic VIPA address. It is a special type of uh, dynamic VIPA. It has a ZCX attribute. We'll have a chart or two that describes what that looks like. Linux will require its own resolver configuration. They'll need to know what the IP addresses are for DNS. We support up to two for those. They will need to know what the DNS search order is, right? Uh, similar to what you do with your TCP IP data today, right, for your ZOS system resolver. You could take the same values you have today for TCP IP and pass those values along, right? It, it would be perfectly fine to use the same DNS addresses, right, that your ZOS system is using as well to resolve any queries. Uh, there is an MTU. The default is 1492, but that can be customized as well, right, if, if you so desire. If you do that, you know, if you do try to customize it, you would need to make sure that you have PathMTU discovery, right, enabled everywhere to ensure that there's no fragmentation, right, that, 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 that ensues. If you're running with a single TCP IP stack, you're done. You don't need to tell us what that stack name is. We'll find it. If you are running with multiple TCP IP stacks on that COS system, uh, you do need to tell us which TCP IP stack you would want us to be configured, uh, connected to, if you will. From a TCP IP profile perspective, there are uh, uh, VIPA range statements like you have today for, for uh, dynamic VIPAs. There, there are new keywords that indicate uh, ZCX, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll see what that, uh, what that looks like. In this time frame, uh, just so you know, even though you can configure uh, ZCXD VIPAs as IPv4 uh, or IPv6, ZCX only supports IPv4. Then there is uh, an interface, this EZA ZCX interface. That's another unique flavor of same host, of EZA same MVS, right, of that uh, device that we basically create. We will do this automatically and activate it automatically 
under the following conditions. If you're using dynamic XCF today, if you have that configured under IP config, you participate in any sysplex types of functions, or you have IET same host enabled for enterprise extender, right? Then we will do this automatically and there's really nothing for you to define from a network interface perspective or, uh, and you don't need to have a start uh, statement either. If you don't, which I think probably would not apply to many users, you would have to manually do the, the definition of a device link and home statement for IET same host, right? And that would uh, enable easy AZCS. If you're doing dynamic wipers, right, you, and you're using OMP route to advertise those, right, you would need any updates potentially, right, to your OMP route configuration. If you're using wild carding today, and depending where these addresses come, you may be all set, right? Important thing to note here is for both steps two and three is, uh, and step four is to really, to propagate these updates across the sysplex to all systems within the sysplex that you may want to start or restart that ZCX instance on, right? So if you want for recovery purposes to be able to move that ZCX instance, you need those dynamic wipers and the correct OMP route configuration and IPsec policy, right, to also be propagated to those systems. Now for IPsec policy, so if you're using IPsec, uh, if you have an IPsec policy active on this system uh, and you have IP filters, right, um, defined, which you would if you have any, any, any form of IPsec, you would need to ensure that you permit routed and local traffic for these devipers, right? So remember that this is traffic coming into ZCX from the outside world, right? Will be coming out uh, over OSO hypersockets and getting routed over same host. So you do need to ensure that you permit those those uh, that traffic, right? And that would be treated in that scenario as routed traffic, right? Into those devipers. So that's just a reminder, some early users this was one of the steps that they hit was that uh, router traffic was not permitted. Okay, what does the VIPA range statement look like? It pretty much looks like a VIPA range statement that you have today. The only caveat is that for ZCX designated the VIPAs, you do need to specify this ZCX keyword. This basically says that this VIPA range statement is describes one or more DVIPAs ex expressly for the purpose of ZCX. This is important because if you omit this keyword and ZCX tries to come up and create this dynamic wiper, even if it's defined in your TCP profile, but it doesn't have the ZCX keyword on, that initialization will fail. So we do do certain things underneath the covers to recognize that this is a special dynamic wiper. For example, we don't want local ZOS applications using that DVIPA for communications, right? While it's local to the ZOS system, it represents a Linux host, right? They cannot bind and open up sockets, right, using that source IP address. This is what lets us police that, basically. Okay? Uh, so that's pretty standard uh, security considerations. Dynamic wipers can get protected with existing, right, with uh, SAF resources at a global level or by specifying a SAF keyword on the individual wiper range statements. Same rules apply here, right? You can make use of that. If you do, you need to ensure that the user ID associated with a ZCX started task has read access to those profiles. If you don't have any of this SAF configuration options enabled, you still need to ensure that the ZCX started task has a UID uh, of zero or read access to BPX super user in order for it to be able to successfully create these dynamic wipers. These are similar rules to any address spaces using dynamic wipers today. All right, you're up and running. You want to see that you made your configurations uh, correctly for the wiper range statements. The, this shows the netstat wiper deconfig display from a console perspective. The only thing that's changed here is that you'll see a new flag of C basically indicates that this dynamic wiper statement, the wiper range statement, is for ZCX, right? So C indicates it's reserved for ZCX use. Other changes that we made is if you do a Netstat Viper Dyn display to show all the active dynamic wipers, you'll see here this is the existing display that you'll see. The thing that's new here is you'll see that ZCX tab that basically says yes or no. If it's a ZCX D Viper, right, you'll get that indicator. So it just tells you that it's basically represents a ZCX address space. You will see the address, the, the job name that created it, just like you would for other ones, and that would be the 
job name of your ZCX starter task procedure. If you look at the, and that's that dev links, right, that shows you basically today all your network interfaces, you'll see that there's a new network interface, EZA ZC, ZCX, that again, in most cases, will automatically get started for you. And in this case, you'll be able to see inbound and outbound packet counts, just like you would for other interfaces. I'm going to talk a little bit here about some of the additional uh, functions within ZCX. Um, this is not, you know, taking a view at it from the high level perspective, not a networking perspective per se, but what are all the different stakeholders, people within your shop that may care about ZCX? And, and you have some traditional uh, users like Zach, who's our systems programmer, and Zach is really one or more people, right? And you guys know in your shops whether it is one or more people, but Zach is basically responsible for uh, systems programming, for the base ZOS system. There may be uh, a different person for networking, storage, security, workload manager, and so forth, right? But uh, certainly Zach needs to understand what does it take to, to stand up a, a ZCX instance? What are the resources that are required and the ZOS definitions? We have IT architects, solution architects, right, that th this is of interest to. We expect those folks have uh, a bit of ZOS skills. Two new people or personas that we're bringing to the table is Fred, who's an application developer, who may be an application developer for Linux today that doesn't know ZOS. In this environment, they could suddenly Fred may be interested in the mainframe in that they could develop applications for Linux, right? Package them as Docker images and deploy them inside ZCX in support of ZOS, right? Without any um, ZOS skills. And Ramesh, who might be a Docker admin, right? If you're doing things with Docker within your enterprise today, right? They may have an interest in ensuring that the Docker configuration here matches your enterprise standards and fits within your enterprise infrastructure. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about things at a high level here. So provisioning, as I mentioned here, there is, we, we talked about the notion that, you know, you need to decide on the number of virtual processors, how much memory to allocate. From a network connectivity, there's dynamic VIPAs, right? There's memory, there's disks, there's uh, things of that nature. There are some Docker configuration settings uh, and all of that. So this is really things that the system programmer may need. There are some Docker configuration options where the system programmer may need to consult with whoever is responsible, again, for Docker administration within your enterprise, right, to understand what value should be specified. But the key notion is that once you've done that, the, the real interface here to deploying a ZCX and managing it after you've deployed it is through ZOSMF workflows. So the idea here is that we provide ZOSMF workflows that basically automate, right, the steps of provisioning a ZCX instance. So view it that once you've done the resource setup, right, in a few minutes you should be able to go through the ZOSMF workflow and have a ZCX instance that you can now start, right? So the workflows we provide are around provisioning a ZCX instance, workflows to reconfigure one after you've deployed it. So let's say you want to go change the amount of memory that you have allocated. You can do that by a reconfiguration workflow. You will need to recycle that ZCX instance to have that take effect. Let's say the, the question was asked about maintenance. Let's say we ship you PTFs that basically refresh the level of Linux, Docker, the, the entire appliance. You would apply those using normal SMP install steps. However, each instance of ZCX that's deployed, right, has a copy of that code. You would need to run through an update workflow to basically refresh any existing ZCX instances with the latest level of Linux and Docker. And then finally, you can deprovision an appliance. Now, once the appliance has been provisioned, you've started it, what do you do? How do you, how do you deploy Docker containers? So that's provided by the Docker command line interface. We provide, basically, when ZCX comes up, there is a special SSH container environment that you could SSH into as a user. So typically, you would be using SSH on your laptops, your workstations, right? You could theoretically do this from a ZOS system as well, if you have SSH installed. You would be accessing this special SSH environment into the our ZCX appliance. 
And that would basically allow you to execute any Docker command line, basically commands that are available through uh, open source Docker. This is not meant to be an eye test. This is just to point you to, there's a lot of Docker commands out there, right? This is just the, if you go to that link, right, you will see basically all the Docker commands, right? And you click on them, you'll get more details about what each one of them are. But for instance, Docker run is a popular one. That's how you run a Docker container. Docker pull, that's how you pull an image from a Docker registry into your Docker server to deploy. The point here is, is that the experience once you're in there is standard Docker, right? You, need, you do need Docker skills. Somebody who's well versed in Docker today in your enterprise on Linux, anywhere, right, should be able to feel right at home here because the commands look exactly the same as they do everywhere else. In terms of users logging on, uh, when you define ZCX, you get to define who's authorized to ZCX, right, to be able to get in there. So there you have three options. You can have a local registry, basically a set of users that are defined locally to that ZCX appliance. You can configure that to go through LDAP, and LDAP could be the Tivoli directory server that's running inside of ZOS that's also configured to interface with RACF. That option would basically allow you to have your standard existing users, right, use the same user ID and passwords and extend them to have access into ZCX. Or you could point to an LDAP server somewhere in your enterprise, right? So those are the three different options that you could basically configure. Now, if you don't like command line interfaces and the Docker help stuff that I showed you earlier was command line uh, driven, so it looks like a Linux type of shell environment, there are tools out there. There is that basically give you a graphical user interface view into Docker. So Portainer.io is one such package, open source package. And this can be deployed within ZCX to give you a browser-based interface into ZCX to do Docker operations. And if we have some time, I'll, I'll show you a couple of uh, more details on this. Then finally, how do you monitor uh, ZCX? So it is an address space, right? So you can use SDSF to look at it. You can use your favorite performance monitor, right, on ZOS to look at the address space, look what it's consuming from a CPU perspective, and so forth. But what about what's happening inside? How do you look at resources being spent for different containers, right, running within ZCX? The good news there is that there is a rich set of open source tooling that, that we've tested and that we're providing documentation on how to basically deploy within ZCX that will give you a nice graphical user interface into what's happening within a ZCX instance. So finally, the, the last topic I want to chat a little bit here, I kind of touched on uh, is clustering and orchestration. So in the container world, there's ways you can take multiple Docker servers and form a cluster so that if you're deploying, for instance, a web server application, you can deploy multiple copies of it, right? So that there's no single point of failure, there's load balancing, there's scalability. With what you get with 2.4, the, the ZCX solution is enabled for what's called Docker Swarm. This is part of base Docker. You can take multiple ZCX instances and put them into a Swarm cluster and be able to, do, to exploit anything that Swarm cluster supports today. I did mention that we have put out a statement of direction. If you click on this link, you can see the, the words around that, that in the future, we've indicated that we want to be able to enable ZCX for Kubernetes clustering. So that's an alternative clustering solution for Docker containers, right? That's um, prevalent in the, uh, in the industry. Uh, so stay tuned there. We don't have specific dates announced yet, but uh, as we have more information, we'll make that available. So with that, I'm gonna to try to show a little bit of a uh, recorded demo. I do have a live system somewhere, but I'm never brave enough to do this live. Let me just show you briefly what this looks like. So this is uh, ZOSMF and the workflows that I mentioned earlier is how you would basically provision a ZCX instance. So there's the dynamic vipers and all those steps that you would do using the traditional, you know, updating your TCPIP profile and all of that. But once you've done that, uh, basically you would log on, you would go into the workflow panel tab and then within this environment here you would create a workflow now 
creating a workflow, basically, you know, we provide the actual workflows to you. So it's not like you're, you're creating an instance of a workflow that we provided. But basically, you'll see here that there's a directory path. This is the default directory or where this, when you install ZCX, these workflows will reside. And one of them is called provision XML, right? There's several types of workflows for reconfiguration, for deprovisioning, and, and so forth. The other thing you can do is you can specify a uh, workflow properties file. So what this allows you to do is basically provide uh, certain variables that we will see on the workflows, customizable parameters, if you will, for the workflow itself so that you don't have to type them in. And when we see what the screens look like, I think it'll, it'll connect the dots. The other thing that you decide here is which system you want to go deploy that on. So you can deploy that on any system within that sysplex that ZOSMF is running in. But the important thing here is you need a ZOSMF active within the sysplex that you're provisioning ZCX to. Then you get to, we click this button that says basically assign all the workflow steps to me. So this is me, Kasimis is Gus Kasimis as the logged on user, give it a name. And from that point on, you'll see uh, this is basically what a active workflow instance looks like. You'll see here that there's a whole bunch of steps, right? There's actually 37 steps to this workflow, right? So this is the part where basically you would select perform to start uh, executing the first step. And the point here was that we really didn't want to document 37 pages or chapters or sub chapters, right, of things you needed to go do, but rather provide a workflow that would do these steps for you. So what you'll see here is this is what the first step basically says is give me the information about this ZCX instance. What you will notice here is there's a ZCX instance name that I'm basically something that I can type in. It's already pre-populated because I used a properties file that had all these settings uh, set aside so that during the demo I'm not typing these things in. You'll see some other values that are not highlighted. Those came from that properties file so that you don't have to go enter those all the time. The next part is how much, how many CPUs does this instance have and how much real memory will you dedicate to this ECX instance? So we specify two virtual processors and six gigabytes. The next one is around IP information, right? So you need a host name for this appliance. You need an IPv4 address, right? We mentioned a TCP IP stack name, if you're running multiple stacks, an MTU size, DNS parameters, and all of that. Because I had these in the properties file, I don't have to go type them in every time, right? But typically, you would want to have to type a unique host name and IP address every time. And then you, you keep going through additional characteristics. So then it, it flies into how many disks do we need, right? How big should they be? What are, what are the high-level qualifiers for those things, right? So these would be other attributes that you would need to know, you know, either uh, DFSMS semantics or uh, other specifications. And we're not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but basically you would page through all of these attributes, right, and specify the characteristics, right, for this ZCX appliance. Now, once you're done with that, you'll see that that first step is complete, and then you start execution of the second step. And the key thing here is this pop-up come up, comes up and says, do you want me to execute all the subsequent steps automatically when you're doing this? Please say yes. Please make sure that it says automate, right? If you don't, you will have to manually click through 36 additional steps. It's going to defeats the purpose of the automation here, right? So if you click that, basically what you'll see here is that it starts executing the remaining steps. And you'll see that there's sub steps in some of these and you can see progress in those steps, right? And now it's on step eight through 37 and it keeps going, right? All right, so at some point, we're gonna to get to the bottom here where you'll see this last step. It says, use the provided start command to start ZCX. So we're gonna take a look at that. This is an inst instruction only step that basically gives you a sample start command that you can use, right, to start this ZCX instance. So this assumes this GLZ proc is a, is a proc that we sample, proc that we ship in ProcLib, and it allows us to override that with the job name that you specified and point to the configuration file that gives it this specific uh, instance information. Now, typically, you would create your own proc, probably, right, for each unique instance, and you don't have to use this, this command itself. 
Now, truth and disclosure, this process here takes about seven, eight minutes, right? So it, it's fast forwarded in this video. The lengthiest steps here are related to allocating and initializing the vSAM files, which can be quite large. Now, once we've provisioned one, how do you start one? As we said, it's a start a task. So in this case, I've created a custom proc, uh, ZCXD GUS1, I, I start it, and it just looks like a start a task, right? So there's not a whole lot of magic here, right? So if we go into it and select it, you'll see that there's messages that'll tell you that we're you know, initializing ZCX. And at some point you'll see this ZCX message that says Docker services, for instance, ZCX DGUS1 are available. So we brought up Linux, right? And it started Docker, right? Uh, within there. I do the find for this message here. It basically says, please connect now using SSH to port 8022 and the server IP address. This IP address is the dynamic Viper, right? That we specified before. Right, so, you know, other than that, it is an address space, right? So if you scroll here on SDSF, you, you'll get to see that there's, you know, properties that you can look at, right? Like CPU time and service classes and all of that GORP, right? Because, you know, and you could have more than one and you can see there the, the rest of the ZCX stuff was uh, uh, showing that. Okay, I think, let's see here. I don't know if there's anything else in here. Ah, okay, so, this is where we did a modify command to display the configuration of the ZCX instance, right? So you'll see where all the different files are, the memory size that we specified, number of CPUs, and, and, and so forth. There is a, another variation of this that will show you the network configuration uh, that that appliance was basically configured with. All right, so once it's up and running, the next thing we're gonna do is this is me from my uh, laptop. Basically, I'm going to SSH into that dynamic wipe address at that port and basically get started. So you, you have a welcome message there that shows you that you're running in the ZCX shell for Docker commands, right? So basically, you know, within this environment, really, what you can do is issue any Docker commands, right? That's really what the intention is. So one of the first ones that we'll execute here is a docker help command, right? So this will show you docker help for all the commands that are available to you, right? And if you want help on the individual commands, right, you can do that as well, right? By specifying docker, the command, and then dash dash help. The next thing you may want to do here is look at the version of docker. So you'll see here what version of docker we're running. It's 18. 0.09.2. This might be helpful if you're looking at Docker documentation out there, right? And you want to know at what precise version you're at. This is the instance. This will change over time. So as we go along and we refresh the code level, that's going to be upgraded as well. We're not only upgrading Linux, but also the uh, Docker version. The next thing that people will tell you is let's run the simplest container there is. So we do a Docker run for Hello World. Right, that's just an IVP just to make sure the infrastructure is running properly. And what you'll see there is that what happened here is uh, we get this message from the container that says, hey, this worked for one thing, so that's good, right? Our Docker server is running. In order to do this, what happened is the Docker client went out to Docker Hub and it asked for a hello world image for IBM Z, for the System 390 architecture, right? SP90X. That image was pulled down, and then basically it deployed that, that image to form a running container within this ZCX instance, right? And that's basically, that's basically it. That's hello world, right? It's as simple as that. Now, if you want to display here to see what containers you have, right, you can issue the Docker PS command, and you'll see here that the hello world, right, it finished a few seconds ago, and so forth. Now, transitioning into this real quickly here, this is what Docker Hub looks like. So this is me looking in Docker Hub and looking at a slightly you know, more elaborate use case. And I'm looking for this Nginx server. Nginx is a web proxy. And I see here that it's out there. It's supported for IBM Z, right? And you'll see here the S390X designation that I mentioned. And within here, you can basically scroll down and you'll see that in, in most cases, Docker Hub is pretty good about providing you 
documentation uh -huh. about what this software is, right? So you'll see that there's a description about what the software at a high level is, where you can find more information about Nginx. And this is open source, so they're pointing you out to, to a wiki page. And then what's more important is they'll give you instructions about what does the command look like, right, that I need to run? So what options do I need to specify and, and so forth? And at least I think you got the basics of uh, hopefully of ZCX and hopefully you got an appreciation of if somebody in, in your shop is interested in ZCX, what are they going to be asking you to do from a networking perspective, right? So hopefully it gave you a bit of the information you will need to, to respond to that.